just the little interesting sort of thing I would like you to think about until sort of after the break. And, and please do come and talk to me. I like recycling. I think I've got somebody else's class here. Um, I wonder where you are most engaged, more, most inspired. When do you feel this is really inspiring? I feel in flow. It's just a question. For me, it's in art galleries. And uh, I just came back from uh, New York. And one of the things I also speak about is this idea that as a whole brain organization, which I will get back to in just a second, you have to look from the outside in. But here I am in, but I'm actually inside, looking inside the other building. And this was a moment for me that was quite inspiring. And it made me think of another moment where I felt very, very inspired. And in fact, it was at Tate Britain 15 years ago. And I was walking, I was looking at everything, being quite, um, I would say, efficient, seeing a lot in a short space. And suddenly I looked up and I saw a very inspiring piece of writing on the wall. On the wall. And it was uh, William Blake, in fact. And what he wrote was, I must create a system of my own or be enslaved by another man. And I think this was really the most profound piece of writing I've ever read because there I was and very often when I went into spaces I was confined by somebody else's system. In my work as a futurist, what I of course do, I use systems to navigate the future. I use a system I call trend mapping, which is a quite interesting system to decode complexity of society. But once you understand the trends, then you can put them into a human mindset setting. And really, the trends do talk a lot about what, or where we are going and, and what people would want. And my job is, in fact, to provide sort of systems and tools and building blocks for people to navigate the future. I love the, what Edward de Bono said this morning, that we just don't have enough good thinking. And again, this is from a Museum of uh, Modern Art in New York. And do you know what this is? It's a tree. It's a little bit dead, but uh, at least it's in a pot. But it's an ideas tree, and it's a tree where people can put their little ideas on. And I thought that was a very poetic way to sort of look at ideas and innovation. What if we all, ha all had a tree in the office where we could sort of put our ideas, greenhouse it, and make it grow? Because, again, I think there aren't enough good ideas for what the workplace might look like. Now, what we know about society is today, I think most of us can kind of confirm this, that sustainability has become a religion. It's also a culture that influences how people do businesses, how we work, how we live. In fact, even when we go to dinner parties, what do we talk about? How we recycle, at some at least. And it's almost like a competition. But when we get back to the workplace, I think that sustainability talks to us in a very informed way. It's a sustainability of the planet, but also of people finding a system whereby we can maintain a good quality of life. I call this uh, empathic leadership, that we have leadership that is powered by ethics and human emotions, actually leaders that have enough empathy to understand how to inspire the people and engage the workforce for the purpose of enriching their lives. And we haven't seen a lot of that happening in the 20th century. Adopting a triple P bottom line is another thing that we talk a lot about. And I speak, of course, more of the bigger picture, not about exactly how the space should look like, but more what comes before we place we start to plan the space. Well, I don't know if anyone knows what that building is. 
It's an energy academy. It is, it's in Denmark. Uh, it's the Samsø Island. It was a community that was about to die out. And the great Dane visionary, he's now named Top uh, 100 Thinkers by Time magazine, came up with the idea that through green innovation, you could perhaps save this community. It's about to close down. So through green innovation, they got together. Everybody started talking to each other. And in fact, it became sort of social innovation. And also today, this is a thriving, prospering community. It is the only community in Europe that has a positive energy balance. They produce more renewable energy than what they consume. In fact, they have a 50% overproduction, which they sell. They put it on the national grid. And it's now a very important source of income. And I think that is a very inspiration inspirational way to create new form of thinking, new communities. So it's just a different way to get together and, and create new ways of, of thinking and working and working together more than anything. This is, of course, the sort of rosy side of the story. The reality is a bit different because we do live in a society where contrast and diversity rules. People are demanding both fast and slow at the same time. Dinner parties, as I just said before, we talk about how eco-conscious we are, but we still consume away. We might even go to the local store in our great car and do the shopping. Bicycling, hmm, it's too cold, it's raining. It's something that we don't do too much, perhaps now and then. So it's safe to say that we have big challenges because really our challenge is to as futurists, also as, as, as um, employers, to understand how we can create sustainable solutions where we balance this contrast. I think that the best model for understanding how to navigate the future is really to look at what neuroscience call the left and the right brain. I will also argue that for far too long, we have banked on left brain thinking and completely ignored the right side of the brain, the more visionary side. We need to move out of the realist zone because it doesn't just happen here. We have to combine it with possibilities. And we heard that this morning as well. We really have to engage the bigger picture. And I think uh, what I'm talking about is the organization of the future, which I would call the whole brain organization. It is really an organization that will think from the outside in, but feel from the inside out. Because that is the only way to engage with your employer, employees, nurture talent and attract new talent. And I do actually quite a lot of talk on futures conferences on human resources. I'm not an expert, I'm more an inspire. But people are so concerned about how can we grow more talent. I don't think that's a challenge. I think the challenge is to create interesting jobs for all those new talents and then have a fantastic, inspiring workplace that goes with the talent. Because if you don't deliver those things, you won't attract the talent. And the one talent you have will eventually leave. So what is whole brain thinking? For me, it's a harmonious way of bringing left and right together. And it's also how I map out the future. Now, I could speak for about 20 hours about this slide. I will save you for that. We don't have time. But my philosophy is that we can easily navigate left brain thinking, looking at the scientific dimension, facts and figures, demographics. And here we look at yesterday news, yesterday's news. And here we look at assumptions. In order to really navigate complexity, we have to understand what people feel and what their value sets are. I know in academic circles, you can't come up with an argument before you've researched it. But in speedy times, we need to really use our gut feelings and intuitively ask ourselves what makes sense. So common sense and intuition is where it should start, understanding what people would want, and then supported with research and maybe some demographics studies and this is how you get an idea of the bigger picture. Now there is probably no ch I mean doubt that we all know that we are facing great changes. 
we talk so much about Asia nowadays, and I think it's interesting that the Chinese proverb, which I very often use, is um, something like this. When the wind of change rises, you have two choices. You can either build a wall, or you can build windmills. I know which model I find sustainable, and it is, of course, using changes as a way to harness the wind as, as an energy and also use the windmill model as a way to navigate chains. Now, those trends very clearly demonstrate that we live in a patchwork society, and it's a polarized society in a global marketplace where people are sharing lifestyle values and ideas across conventional geographic borders. So we really have to rethink the way we interact. And again here, this is an urban exhibition from the Museum of Modern Art, but I just loved it. I loved the way people got together. They in fact started talking in the space. And, and what I felt about that space, it was a space that calmed me down. And I can of course only go by intuition. I don't have the data for this particular space, but it was very much what I felt when I was there. And I thought it represented a sort of the way I can imagine the future interactive uh, workspace. In fact, a laboratory where we will uh, have um, really interesting ideas happening. I think it was uh, David, uh, no, um, Charlie Let better this morning who showed us a space which was supposed to be a creative space, but it was empty, there was no people in there. So this is not how I see the future. I do see the future as a place, a workplace, where we will um, bring people together for the sake of creating better lives for them. Now, <clears throat> this is a model that I use in order to try to map out uh, people's uh, mindsets. And uh, as uh, William was saying earlier, it is not about the complexity of the model. Perhaps a simple model will suffice. There is no, um, not just one, but many possible shapes of the future. I'm not here to tell you all the possible different ways an office could look like in the future. I'm more here to sort of just talk a little bit about things that you have to bring into the equation when you plan tomorrow's workspace. The speed hunters, the creative class, we all know them, they're out there. The speed hunters are very uh, motivated by this idea of empowerment, personal empowerment. They see everything as the rational me personality. And then the younger generation, and I would say very often, I live in this space, I would like to go there, and sometimes I flex over there, and I might even go down there. I flex around this. Uh, I'm not one person at a specific time. I, I more have different identities and personalities throughout the day, depending on what my active activity is. However, I think most of us will vote for that our kids are up in this space because it's all about dialogue, it's all about communicating, it's all about getting together with my friends and me and Facebook and my son is constantly on Facebook and in fact he goes to bed every night with his mobile and his laptop. Now, a new type of people, the emotional we people, and we see them as the social entrepreneurs of the global sustainers, it's all about participation. In fact, recently, Bill Gates have moved from this space into this space because he'd figured out that the new having is giving. So he's giving it all away. He wants to create a better world. Last but not least, in this space, the emotional me, we see happy hunt happiness hunting and meaning hunting as a great motivator. It is, of course,